Well, congratulations, everybody. You've been admitted. <laughs> been admitted to the ATL Photo Night uh, therapy group. <laughs> uh, we're just going to... Yeah, welcome, welcome. We're just going to... I like to just sort of wait a few more minutes. No one's on time. Even though you can't... You have no excuse to say you were caught in traffic anymore, um, which was very convenient here in Atlanta before. But now, you know, you can't use that excuse, right? That's right. Um, it is April 22nd. So this is, um, let's see, we are on, we did, we did not do January. Is that right, Kevin? You yeah. did February. Because January, we were still figuring. Yeah, we started back with um, uh, Deanne Fitzmorris. Mm -hmm. And then February, uh, and then we had we had JP John. in March. We've also oh, had we John. Did. So we, we must have done January. Too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is our fourth one. Deanne, John, JP, yep. and now Alyssa, yeah. Yep. So we're on track for a, um, a great year. Um, yeah, we've already got uh, May lined up. May, we got June. Yep. I'll, what I always think about when we're planning these is that, I mean, it's a year, which is like a long time, right? But it's literally only 12 artists. So deciding and figuring out and slotting the people in so that there's a balance and a diverse a variety a diverse group of people it's it's not easy and it, it's so limited you know it's a full year of time but only 12 12 spots and um you know some people we've had on our list kevin for like a couple of years several years and it's not because well sometimes there's conflicts of scheduling but a lot of times it's just figuring out the best spot for them you know um yeah we've had a list that, for, you know, go ahead yeah, we, we started the list early on, and you know, um, speaking of John Nowak, he was on our he was on our list from from pretty early on. I remember, um, and then it was just a matter of time before we could we could get him. But people are always giving us great suggestions, like uh, Matthew Rond and John Hijack here, and um, uh, Michael David Murphy sends sends me some good recommendations. Lots of people do, and we've we've, we've um, it's really funny how, speaking of Atlanta specifically, no matter how involved you are or whatever, I, I still, um, you know, come upon or are made aware of photographers I've never even, never even heard of, you know, like, and I think that's amazing. And it's like I, my personal quest to, to meet or, you know, become aware of all these people. Um, and that's a big mission of, of ATL Photo Night is to sort of um, shine a spotlight on the the rising stars, you know, not only in Atlanta, but beyond. And we've done that, like, I think of like um, uh, Tropico Photo, Michelle and Forrest, um, who are just like, you know, stellar, amazing photographers. And um, and then we have Alyssa Pointer, who's here. Mm -hmm. Also, um, you know, in the, you know, the first, I'm not going to say you're a rookie by any means, but if you think about a, uh, a career, it can be a long time, you know, divided up into, into sections, maybe. Um, but anyways, we're gonna get we're gonna get to Alyssa. Uh, I'll go ahead and and um, and kick it off. I'm gonna admit, I'm gonna admit my friend Andrew LaFontaine here. Welcome, Andrew. Uh, yeah. Welcome again, everybody else, um, to ATL Photo Night, April, two thousand twenty one. Seems like it was just Y2K like a few years ago, doesn't it? I mean, what the hell? What the hell? Uh, and, then, and then earlier, John Hijack's like, yeah, I joined MPPA in 1980. It's like, wow. Incredible. <laughs> the year before I was born, John. I was one. I was I one. I won't tell you how old I was. <laughs> I wasn't. <Yep. laughs> I wasn't old. Yeah. Uh, but but w welcome everybody. Um, welcome to ATL Photo Night. This is uh, the fifth year of ATL Photo Night. And um, if you've never been before, even more of a huger, bigger 
more big welcome. Um, <laughs> ATL Photo Night is something that my partner Kevin Lyles and I started in 2016. Yep. And the, we, we really didn't know what we were doing at first, like many um, things that creative people <laughs> start. We just wanted to uh, talk about the work that we do. You know, as a freelancer, it can be very uh, sort of uh, isolating. Isolating, and yeah, there's a lot of uh, you're, you're secluded. You're in your office, or you're when you do go out and work, you're working by yourself a lot of times. So I th we we just had this idea, like, isn't it healthy to sort of get together and talk about the work we do? And that was a big turning point in general. I think in, as a larger industry maybe as well but turning the corner from the older i'll say olden days of like ultra hyper competitive um you know undercutting people and not sharing work and those types of things we really just we were on the same wavelength of like you know we are going to be as a community as a city of a network of photographers stronger together um and that's what etl photo night's about every month we invite an artist photographer to join us and we talk about their work together it's a conversation it's not a, an artist talk where you sort of sit there in, in dark silence it's really a conversation and um, it's always free it's run by artists and it's for artists and the whole uh, point of what we do is to investigate the creative process through conversation so um, we've been doing that this is the fifth year like I said uh, a couple quick announcements to leading, you know, bridging off of the, the, the fifth year anniversary. Um, we have uh, our next event, May, May 27th, Stephanie Ely. This is breaking news. Stephanie Ely is going to be joining us. She's an amazing, uh, really incredible um, commercial lifestyle photographer, has been doing her own thing and just killing it, hustling here in Atlanta, um, based here in Atlanta. She's gonna be joining us, another great conversation. And then in June, June is the actual fifth anniversary of when we started ATL Photo Night. So we're like, we're, we're, we're cooking up some big plans. We got a, we got a party planner involved. We got um, <laughs> all kinds of stuff, a jumpy house, a blow up castle. Yeah, all that stuff. But seriously, uh, we are planning something for June that will be, uh, more special than a Zoom conversation. So stay tuned for that. Um, uh, and the way you can follow all this is, is on social media, of course, unfortunately on Facebook, but also on Instagram and Twitter, um, ATL Photo Night and also atlphotonight.com. So we use right now, you know, this is not how we normally do it. If it's your first time, we usually have been always meeting in person really vibrant community we come together we hang out and chill and talk about art but now we're doing it on zoom and we um we have a this ticketing thing through eventbrite you register you get the link if you're here you know about it obviously we'll keep doing that but follow us because we'll be announcing um june what we're going to do for that and all those things it's going to be really exciting but um again my name is raymond mccray jones my friend kevin lyles is here and I'm going to let him introduce our very, very special guest tonight, Alyssa Pointer. Thank you, Ray. Uh, I cannot believe it's been five years. So Ray was our very first speaker. I think uh, John was there. We might have had like 10 people in the basement of a co-working space. What was the name of that place? We always forget the name of that. Foster. Yeah, it did. Foster. Foster. Yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. But yeah, yeah uh, right off of Ponce. Yeah, we had a good time and uh, we knew that we had something special uh, way back then. And, and I can't believe it's been five years since we've done that. But um, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're so glad to have you. Like Ray said, this is not how we like to do things. I know we all have Zoom fatigue at this point. Uh, I can't tell how many Zoom calls I've been on personally. Um, but we may be able to do something in person very soon. That's what we're really trying to work on, um, obviously following guidelines and being safe. But we can't wait to see you guys in person and uh, catch back up uh, and do things how we used to do. Uh, so yeah, let's get right into it. Um, so glad to have Alyssa here, uh, staff photographer with the Atlanta Journal. And she and I were talking, I think we met in 2018. You said that was your first year at the paper. Um, and, and I'm really excited tonight. Uh, you are sharing work all from 2020, right? Like everything that you're showing today is from last year, which was 
as what we a know. year oh my god i know right i know uh, <laughs> yeah just when we thought like newspapers not me but a lot of people say newspapers are dead they're not important uh you know 2020 happened and it just proved how vital uh visual communication is uh in this day and age and and being able to document all the things that happened i mean obviously you know covid was everywhere and that was the story of the year but so many things happened like right here in atlanta just to you know top it off i mean it was god it was it was it was insane as we all know uh so we'll get started sharing her work uh Alyssa, just tell us a little bit about uh yourself and how you got to you know be working at the at the constitution and how you got here Right. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming along on this journey. I'm excited to be a part of ATL Photo Night. Um, I have been at the newspaper for uh, almost, it would be three, I think it's almost four years. I started in 2017, so math, didn't do the math there. But um, I am originally from Georgia. I grew up in Jonesboro, Georgia, which is in Clayton County. If you don't know where Clayton County is, that's where the airport is a good way for people to know where that is. And I ended up going to Western Kentucky University to study photojournalism. And while there, I interned at a few papers. My first internship was actually not paid, unfortunately, but it was at Creative Loafing Atlanta, rest in peace. Ah. <laughs> and I, I pretty much worked the weekends, but I did a lot of like interesting gigs. I learned a lot from the editor there who at the time was Joss Davis. And actually, uh, Dustin Chambers was my first assistant photo editor. Um, oh, cool. So it's really fun to kind of work alongside him now but I that was my first internship I ended up interning at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel the Louisville Courier Journal and then I had an internship that turned into a residency at the Chicago Tribune so I was there for a year um, and the whole time I was there I kept telling the editor you know if a job opens up in Atlanta I really want to go back because that's where I'm from and I'd love to tell stories there and it just so happened that a job opened up I was told they really hadn't hired someone in 11 years which is that's ridiculous amazing. So I applied for the job um, and I, somehow I got it. So I'm, I've been here now, like I said, for four years and it's been a wild ride. When I first got here, you know, 2018 is when Stacey Abrams kind of had her run for governor. And mm -hmm. I had a photographer friend at the Tribune tell me that I brought the windy politics from there down here. And I was like, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I did, but it's just been very interesting. So, yeah. Well, we're glad to have you. Uh, how many photographers are at the AJC now like staff so there are five there okay. now yeah five yeah. and then we have a video production crew which is two people okay so seven you could say yeah I'm just thinking back to like the early 2000s when there was like yes, I've heard these <laughs> yeah I mean I know you, everybody's heard stories like of how big uh staffs used to be uh before they all got decimated but it's just crazy to think I mean AJC had like 25 or something it was just an incredible number um and and but it's still great to see you guys still pumping out content and doing a great job i hate using the word yeah. content you know making amazing images uh, yeah. exactly uh well, we're going to get right into this and we'll start off with uh your first picture that you have here uh yeah. can everybody see that okay does that look good yeah all right good yeah uh from 2020 and and i believe this is your uh interpretation of what social distancing means, right? Yes, this is, uh, I just put that in there for that purpose, just a thought of what 2020 started out to be, essentially. Um, I took this picture kind of late in 2020. I think I took it in October, but, you know, everyone was trying to measure what social distance was, the six feet. And so this was um, them, there was a um, music festival happening at Centennial Olympic Park in October. I think it was two days but they were creating these pods that were six feet apart. But I wanted to just put this image in at the beginning just to solidify what 2020 was. It was a year of not being close to anyone or supposedly wearing masks, you know, trying to keep your distance. Um, and so, yeah, this is just kind of a symbolic photo. Yeah, I mean, 2020 was the year of six feet. That's all we heard was six feet, six feet, six feet. So um, yeah, this is, a, this is a nice way to illustrate what that means because we all, we're, we're so tired of hearing that. And uh, I'm going to go to the second image because I, was, yeah. I like it so much. And these, uh, I believe these pigeons are probably six feet apart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they are not six feet apart. So this is an image I made. Um, so right after, you know, Atlanta shut down, the, um, if some people don't remember this, but the final four for March uh, Madness was supposed to happen. And so I had to go out um, and kind of make some images of what was not happening, you know? So the MARTA station there was actually closed. And I had actually saw this scene before. 
So I was happy I was able to go make this image of these birds, but um, the sign in the background that's red is just kind of showing, you know, people would be going to um, Mercedes-Benz Stadium to go see the basketball game, but it just never happened. So I was just trying to show the desolate area that was Atlanta at the time. I, I think it's great. I really love it. I think it shows that, that, that emptiness that we all felt because um, this would normally be a packed sidewalk. Um, and, you know, this is kind of like uh, feature hunting, right? When you are a newspaper yeah. photographer, um, for those of you not familiar, it's so often like, oh, find us a feature, go find features. And that can be anything, you know, just people walking around doing stuff. And so this is a, a new take on that in 2020, um, trying to find, well, not trying to, but just going out and finding where no one is, you know. Um, exactly. And, and I wanted to say, if you guys have questions, mm -hmm. uh, throw them in the chat uh, and we'll get to them along the way or, or save time at the end if we can. Um, and, and we'll take care of that for you. Um, and uh, we're gonna go on to uh, this next image, which is, is uh, just screams uh, 2020. Is this, um, I believe this is making uh, hand sanitizer, yes. is that right? Yes, this, so that was at a, yeah, that was at a drugstore in Calhoun um, and that's alcohol that was siphoned from those big yellow containers um, into that big jar container that he was kind of mixing. Um, and so we were able to go into a pharmacy. I took this picture in April um, because the pharmacy was being allowed to make it. They were being, they were approved by the FDA to create, um, you know, hand sanitizer. So they were, I don't remember if they, the alcohol was too strong, but um, I was able to be in that room with him. You know, he was covered up. I was covered up from what I could be and make this image. Um, but yeah. So Alyssa, this, this is April, 2020. Mm-hmm. So very, like very soon after, this is like the phase, if everyone can go like back in, in, in time and imagine, this is when we were like really fucking freaked out. Like nobody knew. So, I mean, I was, I, I remember getting um, calls for work like around mm -hmm. like April and um, they either would get canceled or I would turn them down because it just seemed too risky. What was it like? working I mean now people have the vaccine it's it's just it's we, we we forget quickly but it was really really scary and um a lot of people had the luxury of well I shouldn't say luxury but had homes where they could stay inside of um and where we're not working or we're working from home mm -hmm. what did how did you guys handle that as like uh as an institution as um as reporters I mean you can't really the paper never stops printing it doesn't. Um, and and so we were the do? ones. We so the photographers were frontline the whole time. We can't make images from our front door. You know, I can't. I can't say they can't get an assignment to go to Calhoun and make it from my front door. So we were always out and about. Um, there was a lot of scrambling for PPE. Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely, I was speaking up saying, "Listen, y'all got to get us something because I'm out here risking my life essentially every day, and it would be great to know that you cared about me." So there was a lot of conversation and get and get it. Hey, listen, because I'm not getting you know if you get an assignment during um, COVID from some people, you got the um, hazard pay. Like yeah. I didn't get a hazard pay, so I'm just like, show me that you care. So it was definitely um, hard. Um, but it was just something you had to keep doing. And I was able to keep my distance, you know, towards the beginning, honestly, when I went to go take pictures of people who are making masks, I honestly would say, do you have an extra one? You know, like, mm. can I, can I borrow one or do you mind giving me one? Some people were happy to give me some. There was a textile industry that was making the 90 KN95 masks. So, mm. it, I mean, it was just a lot of kind of like, thank you for letting me be in this area, but let me keep my distance as well. It, it was just very interesting to be a part of because like you said, no one was out. I mean, at points downtown, it was just homeless people that were outside, you know, and it's like, do I feel safe being by myself here? You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it, guess, was, yeah. It, it was it was crazy because I was out covering, you know, new stuff, too. And I remember just just that eerie feeling and being scared and mm -hmm. like knowing you have to be there at the same time. Uh, it was just. Yeah. It was just wild um, to be out in that. And, and you guys were out. I mean, I was out every few days, but you were out every day doing that. Yeah. You know? And to say, um, I actually did have a scare at the beginning. So I was covering the state legislative session and one of the senators actually had it. And he had 
spoke to me the day before he found out he had it about my camera wow. equipment. And I usually don't indulge people talking to me about my camera equipment because I'm like, look, I'm trying to work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I'm in the Senate, it's different. But um, so I actually did have to quarantine. I did not get COVID, but I did have to quarantine for like five days because we didn't know. And at yeah. that time, I was telling people earlier, a lot of people didn't want to put the mask on because it was kind of like, well, if no one else has it on, specifically, I would say in, in, in media, there was, a, there was a hesitation at first to put mm -hmm. the mask on because a lot of people weren't wearing them. But after I was exposed, I was every day, I had that thing on. <laughs> I was like, yeah. this is not worth it. So yeah, it, it was hard at the beginning to try to figure everything out. I think that was before the governor shut down the whole state or, you know, for the two or three weeks that he shut it down. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was just, like I said, it was just incredible to be out and to be like an empty cityscape, no cars. Uh, however, there were cars where people were racing cars around Atlanta uh, <laughs> <laughs> every day. That, that was that was wild. Um, and, and I want to talk about this next image uh, that you made here. You know, I remember finding I had the same thing found signs on churches in different places. Uh, uh, one, one church I photographed had it said, uh, wash your hands, you sinners. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> those kinds of signs. That's pretty good. <laughs> I know, right? I know. Um, this was a good one too, though. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, hope is also contagious because it was so damn depressing. It was like the world was ending, right? Yeah. And yeah. there were so many to photograph. And so I, I really liked this one because it was like, hey, we're getting our business done at the bottom, but we want you to know <laughs> that um, COVID is still a thing, but we're thinking about you guys. And that was up in Rome, Georgia, where there was a lot of um, cases. And so they were actually impacted a lot up there. So I was just kind of doing scene setters there. Yeah, and the further you got away from the city, the less likely or the more likely you were to run into people who didn't want to wear masks or, or follow exactly. the protocols. Um, you know, it's like being in a different country sometimes when you get outside, outside of Atlanta. Into the rural I area. mean, you can just go to Cobb County sometimes, but you're not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Those wild. People. You would go from one place to the next and you were like, hey, everybody, you know, there's a pandemic, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. did the news yeah. make it here, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. And, and I, I really want you to tell us about this, um, this lovely image here. Um, yeah. yeah. So this ahead. is Joe Jordan. He was the owner of Cato Shoe Repair, which is actually not in business anymore. Um, but so um, reporter and I went to his, this man's shoe shop. He had been repairing leather shoes and leather goods for years in Buckhead. And he was falling behind on rent. In addition to having loaned some money out to his family, um, he was finding it hard to pay, you know, this was, uh, I don't remember the date of this, but it was kind of further into the pandemic. I want to say maybe May or June. So we kind of profiled him to say, what our business is looking at? You know, a lot of businesses were not able to stay open. I know of a, a, another business that had to shut down, you know, a newly built office that they had created. So we focused on him because he was 82 years old. I mean, he's working alongside his wife and she was ready for him to quit, but this man loved what he was doing. And you can really see it in his, um, just the way he handled himself. And so after that story was published, you know, telling about his situation specifically financially, because of the people he had done work for in the past, they all started just pouring in money into his business and they ended up paying off his debt and giving him enough money that he was able to say, you know what, I will retire, you know, um, which was wow. really great. Yeah. But the thing was, you know, this man's so old, he had this mask, you see it on his face, it kept slipping off um, of his face. And every time a customer would come in, you know, a reporter and I were trying to stand back. It was a small little area, but it, it would just keep falling off. And some people weren't wearing masks. So it's like, how do you at 80 years old stop working? You can't, especially if you're in debt, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was really good to kind of have the story of hope you know, of an older man just trying to make a living because he just loved working with his hands. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you know, being a, a newspaper photographer, um, you've got to go from, you know, breaking news situations to a, to a city council meeting, to whatever, to something like this and being able to transition and to make a portrait, like a beautiful portrait like this in such a short amount of time. I mean, I mean, sometimes you have a lot of time, but a lot of times, you know, you have like five, 10 minutes. So. Um, you know, when, when you're taking portraits like this, um, do you, like, what's your approach? I mean, when, when you're, when you're working with people, do you, you know, how do you get them to like, um, you know, be themselves in front of the camera and, and yeah. show you who they are? Cause I feel like you do get a glimpse of a, a bit of what this guy's going through in this portrait. 
Yeah, it's just a conversation, you know, talking to them about, you know, how his day has been, maybe asking them questions about how, what they like about their job, what they don't like, kind of get people comfortable. Because once people start talking, they kind of let the mm -hmm. idea of, oh God, I'm being photographed down. Um, and it also helps if there's a reporter there talking to him when mm -hmm. you can kind of catch these moments of him thinking mm -hmm. um, or so you can kind of interact as the three of you kind of do a dance. Um, but yeah, I definitely talk to people and try to make them comfortable. I'll put my camera down first, have a conversation, let them know what I'm thinking. You know, I ask them, do you want to smile? If they're, if they know what the story is about, you know, how do you want to present yourself? Cause that matters too. It's a transaction. So, you know, just let's work together to make a good picture. Hey, yeah, you're exactly right. And it's funny cause having a reporter sometimes can be the worst thing in the world. Um, trying to get a portrait yeah. made, um, <laughs> but other times it's amazing when you can, like you said, have that dance going where you can work off of each other and, and really come away with something special. Um, yeah. You did a really nice job here. Um, Thank you. Now, this next image is one of those images of like, where were you when uh, this happened, right? Like we all were like, holy shit, is this Atlanta? What is going yeah. on? Uh, I, for me, real quick, I remember I took a motorcycle ride that day and I got back and I was like, oh, it's a, it's a protest, you know, it's, you know, just another protest, whatever. And this was happening. And I've always kicked myself for not uh, being up there taking pictures that day. But you got an incredible image of this scene that we all saw unfold live on television. Uh, so take us through uh you know, how, how you ended up in this position and were able to get this. Cause I know it was like a several hours or like all day kind of like March, you know, peaceful March and protest uh, through the street. It started somewhere. You can tell us where it started and, and how it ended yeah. up here. So I started, I want to say maybe around one or two o'clock before I actually got down to Centennial Olympic Park where the march began because they marched from Centennial to the state capitol. I um, went to the Georgia state capitol and I had a quick conversation with state troopers because state troopers um, kind of uh, guard the state capitol. And I was just like, hey, guys, what do you think this is going to be? You know, trying to gauge. I didn't know if they hear anything. And they were like, we don't think it's going to be anything. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I kind of felt that. I didn't know. Because to be honest, I actually had bought a pair of goggles, like swimming goggles, because I yeah. had read something on someone's Instagram about what you should be prepared with when photographing a protest like this. Or, and, and I didn't know it was going to be like this, but I said, maybe, you know, maybe I should just get something to try to prepare myself. So the march happens. It was peaceful. They marched from Centennial to the state capitol, had a little rally, marched back. On their way back, there started to be some agitation with the police officers that I believe were at the precinct they're at CNN, because there is a police precinct at CNN. Mm. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah. Um, and so that's when the agitation started to happen. Started to happen. So I want to say that this police car probably was set on fire maybe an hour and a half, two hours after the initial agitation, right? Because essentially it was just a bunch of people in an area just going back and forth, you know, getting angry and upset and you know, sharing words with cops and seeing the cops put their riot gear on. So it was kind of like we were bubbling up to this moment, I honestly would say. So the way that I got this shot, I, I asked to go to this protest um, before I knew it was going to be what it's going to be. And they were going to send me by myself. But then at the last minute, they added um, Ben Gray, who is used to work at the Atlanta Journal Constitution. He also, I believe, used to be editor there as well, photo editor. Um, so we kind of met up, said our hellos, made sure we, you know, had our, each other's backs. As this started to unfold and get super violent, I started to step back because I personally didn't feel safe. I'm one of those photojournalists who's like, if I don't feel safe, I am more important than the photo. I know some people think differently and that's your choice, but I want to go home <laughs> at night with um, my hands and my legs. So um, I, <laughs> I spoke sure. with Ben, I saw Ben being close and I said, well, if Ben is going to be close, there's no point of us being in the same area. And then I got a text from Curtis Compton, who was also my coworker at the AJC, who was watching this unfold. And he said, hey, I think there's a good vantage point if you get on top of that parking garage, oh, which wow. is like to show the importance of having a visual editor or it's just someone who think, can think for you in the moment. And so after I read that, I went up to the top. Um, AP photographer, photo editor, Mike Stewart was up there. I think he had went down because I actually have a picture of him. I was going through my images and there's a picture of him in the corner of the, of the parking garage standing there taking images. But um, I get up there, I make these images, you know, I think they had already burned something else. And I decided uh, the police had came up and they're like, everyone's got to go back down. 
So they made everyone go back down from the parking garage. A lot of people were just watching from each level of the parking garage. Mm-hmm. I think there was like five levels. And so for me, like I said, I felt more comfortable getting a wider shot. And I was super happy that Ben did come because I wouldn't have been able to get that shot. Because usually you want to stay where the, you know, the action is. But I, I do find it, it was an advantage. I was telling everybody I wouldn't have got the shot if I had, didn't have been there because I would have been at the bottom taking those images of the car being burned. So. And Ben was like in the damn fire. He was like right up on it, wasn't he? His images, you know, yeah, I remember good for him. his images. And I was like, <laughs> Ben, that's wild, man. You were like right in the middle of it. Yeah, he was. I mean, that's when I saw him. We didn't even speak, but I saw him get close. I said, you know what, he's got this. Let me, <laughs> let me go up on the parking garage and see if I can get a better angle. And so that that's what I got. I'm just a big advocate for people shooting at their own comfort level. I mean, yeah. if you don't feel comfortable being close, you don't have to be close. Don't be mad at yourself that you weren't close. You can get other images mm-hmm. if you, you know, check your vantage point. And that's just for anybody. I don't know. It's important, yeah, thing, I think. It's just so cool to see this angle too. I mean, those up close images are what we see so much from protests and civil unrest. Um, in, in well, we're taught, we're taught in school, aren't we, that um, if the picture's not good enough, you're not close enough. Exactly. A famous Robert Kappa saying, so I think there's, you know, personally, there's a lot of things we're taught um, as journalists, as for journalists that are um, antiquated, you know, theories of antiquated approaches to telling stories today, like the, like the idea that you shouldn't um, get too close to subjects or you shouldn't get to know them too well or you shouldn't personally become invested in stories. And um, I think a lot of times that can be detrimental to telling stories as a storyteller. So um, yeah, it's, it's great to hear someone like you, Alyssa, um, sort of taking back personal control in a way of, of your own way of, of, um, of of telling a story of, of like working, I guess, you know, because yeah. you, if, you, if you're forcing yourself to be in that situation and you're, and you're not prepared, I mean, that's like, it's so dangerous. And what good, what, you know, like that's, I've been there and I know, like, I, I remember, you know, telling myself, like, I'm supposed to do this. This is what photojournalists do. And, uh, and it's so, it can go bad so quickly. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a big lesson to be learning just, uh, really being a, you know, like a, a normal person first and, and trusting right. your instincts, right? And then applying your craft to to that situation and whatever you're ready for, because like a normal everyday person is not equipped or prepared to walk into a protest, exactly. especially like the ones this summer that were, um, each one of them was, you know, as soon as the sun went down, we're turning pretty violent for a while there. Yeah, uh, that takes serious training to be to be ready to work in that environment, right? That's what conflict photographers do. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I didn't have training. <laughs> I just went yeah. out there, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I figured it out, you know. And like I said, and then this is for anyone: just you don't have to be the person that takes conflict photos. You can be the person that likes to take pictures of hands. You know, like there's a area that you can really flourish in. So don't feel like forced to do all of the things just because you exactly. see people doing it. Yeah. This isn't yeah. my soapbox, but yeah. <laughs> I moved ahead, but I, I, I want to say one thing before we do is like just having this angle is so nice to see the, mm-hmm. the scale of mm-hmm. what's happening. Very um, important, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know how many pictures were taken up here, but this is the one that I remember from this angle. Uh, and this, did this run on the front the next day? It, it did. Um, and I think it was the whole picture. We have a tendency to crop things, but I think it gave me the whole photo for this um for the front wow. page of this but I really did and I I'm the type of photographer if I see something good while I'm shooting I'm like oh my god look at that ah. and so I was <laughs> talking to myself while I was shooting this but I just was like oh look, you know I love I always loved skylines and when I was in Chicago everybody was um um crapping on Atlanta skyline I was like our skyline's <laughs> nice so that was just me saying you know also showing the skyline back then that's funny though talking to yourself I've done the same thing many many times yeah you're like oh my god I got a good one you know <laughs> <laughs> oh that's incredible um and you've got several pictures here from, mm-hmm. from like the summer of protest pretty much um here yeah. in um tell us a little little bit about this one and I think you have a few more yeah um, so what that was like 
So covering the protest, like I said, I didn't have any conflict training. I kind of just felt comfortable. I made myself comfortable. If I didn't want to get too close, I didn't get too close. For this uh, um, March, these people started at Centennial Olympic Park, ended up walking all the way to the 17th Street Bridge and, and Atlantic Station and then walking back. And I had no wow. idea where they were going. <laughs> wow. And I almost didn't keep going with them. I ended up stopping at 14th Street and I ended up going like towards Peachtree street um and then i just look over the bridge on 14th and i see them sitting on the bridge and i was like damn it <laughs> so i <laughs> i ran to the 17th street bridge and i got them there and then they ended up walking back and i got this image of this young lady i really liked it i didn't know what her sign had said until i was sending image on deadline um mm -hmm. i, I like this image because she is a black woman giving respect to another black woman her sign is for keisha lance bottoms the mayor of atlanta who was complaining about people being violent during protests. And so she's just using her sign, she's using her voice, she's using her beautiful dark skin to protest. Um, and it was really beautiful seeing people walking down or seeing them walking down, I believe this was uh, Spring Street and people were up in their high rises banging pots and pans, you know, like mm. really, it was beautiful to just be a part of. But um, I, I just really loved um, this young lady because she's, first off, she's fit. I don't know if you see those abs down there, but she's <laughs> also, um, a black woman and black women have been known throughout history to lead marches and to lead resistance and stuff like that. So I really wanted to put a focus on her in this moment. So that's why I really like this image. Well, you, you did a great job. Uh, this is a really nice one. Uh, and I, I think that uh, Keisha, is that the speech she gave with Killer Mike? Yeah. yeah. They were both like, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's when Keisha was like on the national spotlight when she was like, y'all go home, you know, like, you know, don't, I mean, don't tear things up. You know, uh, I honestly was saying that under my breath the first night because I was like, yeah. what is the point? <laughs> yeah. And she was talking about people who were causing trouble, not like obviously right. right. peacefully protesting and, 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 you know, using their voice. Uh, but she right. was like Atlanta's mother uh, that day. I remember that. Uh, yeah. Very poignant. Um, yeah. And uh, <laughs> you've got, let's see, you've got another one here. And this yeah. Is from the, uh, so shooting this is over at Wendy's. Yeah. yeah, so this is, um, I think this was the second day of the Rayshard Brooks maybe protest. The first day I was in, um, I was coming back from Brunswick because I covered the Ahmaud Arbery, um, tr not the trial, but when they were, I guess, figuring out if there would be a case. I don't remember what the mm -hmm. word of that is. Um, but this is, yeah, these are people, there was a march that I came from, I want to say from the Georgia State Capitol to this Wendy's, which isn't that far, maybe two, maybe two miles. Mm -hmm. And this was after they had burned the Wendy's down. And if you go there now, there is no Wendy's. It's kind of yeah. a blank spot and they want to kind of make it like a community spot. Um, but I took this image of people kneeling, you know, they all have their fists up. They were doing kind of a moment of silence. And this woman who was in the community was speaking and it was very poignant. The thing I love about working in the city you know, I didn't grow up in the city. I grew up in the suburbs, Clayton County. And so just being able to be a part of all of these things that make the South the South, but in this big city, mm -hmm. um, it's very, it, I love it. And so there was this lady there, you know, this was her neighborhood and she was complaining about, you know, someone came down and burned one of the only places that I have to get my kids meals when I, you know, can't cook. And it's like, when you're not there in that moment to hear those things, you don't really, you see the pictures and you're like, okay. But when you get that, that, um, you know, those words, those people's real emotions, it's very, it's a lot to take in, but I think it's also beautiful because you're able to see all the different aspects that make Atlanta such a, a unique city. You know, and that's so important being, you know, a, a, a photojournalist um, is, is getting to know the people and telling those stories and not just taking pictures of burning cars and people protesting and like, you know, we've all been there. You, you show up at a protest or, you know, anything like that and there's a slew of photographers and you know most of them are out to get just those those images of people being aggressive and violent the action mm -hmm. yeah the action right i mean that's that's what they're there for and you know half of them don't have any journalism training at all and it's just people taking pictures and you, you know you just ethics are out the window all those types of things but you know as a journalist you know it's just so refreshing to hear you talk about like hearing that woman talk and and, and what that means for her and her community and that, like you said earlier it's a it's an exchange, you know, like as a journalist, you are giving up your time and, 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 and getting something from them in return, but it, it's, it's a dialogue and, uh, and, and you know all this, but it's just, uh, it's incredible to hear that, that part of it is not just, you know, the, the, the crazy end of it, you know, that we all see so, so much of when there's civil unrest. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that's great. And then, you know, seeing stuff like this also uh, uh, yes. is, helps out. This is the Southern part I was talking about. You know, we're in the Bible Belt. So it's like seeing this yeah. sign of like, please give us peace. The Bible says it, you know, and then, I mean, and when you'll see in the next picture, I mean, it's totally another protest of people doing things that's not peaceful. So it's like, I just love all of these in, intrinsic things that are Southern. Um, but this was at the Stone Mountain protests that happened. There was a group of folks that were coming in to save their Southern history. And there was a group of folks that were like, no, nah, that's not okay. So they clashed in front of this church, literally for hours. They were just like I said earlier, you know, you put people in an area, they'll start bubbling up. So people were just kind of standing around yelling at each other, yelling their ide ideology at each other. And essentially it did get heated. Um, I, in this situation, again, I'm not, you know, I don't know, I don't know conflict training, but I felt comfortable because I had a slew of photographers that were kind of kind of checking in on me. I, I mean, I, I am the only black woman staff photographer at the paper and there aren't a lot of black women in photojournalism in staff positions. Um, we have a joke that we call ourselves unicorns because once you see one, you know, it's like <laughs> a magical <laughs> thing. Um, so a lot of people were just like, hey, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Because for the most part, I'm not yelling my ideology at someone. So they're not really bothering yeah. me. I'm kind of just moving around taking images. So it was interesting to just be able to see all of those dynamics in this in, on a church parking lot of all places. Um, yeah, someone said just notice is like, yes, he had a prosthetic leg. Uh, but he was going in as you can see so is, in this scene right here is the person on the right did they try to take his confederate yes, flag there is a lot of trying to take flags and burning them after you've yeah. taken them yeah I hey think. Alyssa mm -hmm. could you um could you expound on the idea of um objectivity and being a photojournalist uh you know when you live you're a photojournalist who, who works for a place that covers the news of the place where you live. Right. Not only that, but um, the stories and the things that were happening this year, you and, and us, we were all like a part of that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, from the, the uh, coronavirus stuff to the, the social justice, Black Lives Matter protests to the, the um, uh, all the stuff with uh, police brutality like in the the sort of bubbling up of this uh, white supremacist stuff that had always been there, but sort of in hiding, um, we're taught as journalists, as photojournalists, that you have to be objective. I mean, but as we know, it's kind of a false idea, like what is objectivity? How do you, so I'm just curious how you, how you work day, daily in these environments where you're, for the good of telling the news, um, for the good of reporting the news to everybody, you know, you need to try to be objective to, to tell all sides or both sides of the story. But a lot of times um, you're a resident here, you're, you know, uh, you're sort of part of the story too. Is it, do you ever find it hard to, or do you ever ask yourself, am I being fair or, I'm just curious. Yeah. I definitely sometimes find it hard to be in, uh, not find it hard, but find it emotional to be a part of Black Lives Matter protests because the when people do speak their emotions, I do feel them uh, deeper than I would feel, let's say a white supremacist speaking his emotions. But I, I am able to, so for that, I would say I do get emotional. I cry. Like, I, I'm a crier. I'm an emotional person. So I may be crying while I'm taking pictures. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, but I try to just take, and I think, honestly, I think that helps me, right? I, I'm feeling what these people are feeling in, the, in that specific situation. And I'm able to show, like we were saying earlier, not just the action, but the humanity of what the hell is happening in these moments, you know? Yeah. So I think it helps me. I also would say... Um, not to go into this long story, but I went to three different elementary schools as a kid and I was able to, it, the first one was private and all black. The second one was public and mixed. And the third one was all white and they were very prominent. So I have had this opportunity in my life to be around a bunch of different people and kind of see their way. I wouldn't say I agree with a lot of ways, but I can be, I can be 
unbiased in a sense and be like, hmm, that's what you're thinking, fine. And not want to retaliate in two seconds and be like, you're wrong. I, and, I, and I hated that as a kid, you know, I don't want to go through the elementary schools, but it's like now as an adult, I see the good that came out of that because I, like I said, the last school, everyone was rich and no one looked like me, but I, I learned what that life was like. And then the public school, honestly, that was the first time I ran into racial discrimination was in the first, second grade. Third. Um, and, you know, I was taught that my skin color was a problem because someone told some parents told their kid they couldn't be my friend anymore. And I was like, why? I don't understand. So it's like, I've had all of these different layers that have happened a really long time that I've just kind of been like, okay, let's see what this is about. So I think I am able personally to be objective. I may not agree with you. Mm -hmm. I, it may be heavy at points. I may say, you know what, I'm going to walk away. I, and like I said earlier, I'm able to do that because I'm just like, listen, I'm not trying to argue with you or I'm trying to go home. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I, and I, for some people it's different. And I just think I've, I was just given that opportunity and it, it has helped me along the way. Like I've been in environments where people who are uncomfortable being around me will start telling me stories that are very racist. And I'm just like, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but, but I just kind of, I, I'm like, okay, this person's having a moment and you know, it's hard, you know, you, it will bear on you at times and you'll have to go talk to someone about it or like really release that in a way that's helpful to you. Um, yeah. But I mean, in, in certain situations, I think it helps, right? Cause it, everyone has a privilege. Like if there's been so many times that a black woman will be like, I am so glad you're here to take my picture because I am more comfortable with you. And it's like, well, damn, you know, I didn't make that decision. It just so happened to come that way. But so I think that there's a privilege in just being like the person that maybe you're able to get a bigger, a, a better connection. But at the same time, I can be like, you know, I can be like, hey, you know, we may be the same, but I'm not gonna give you anything special. And that's been hard to do really with, uh, I wanna say uh, legislators. <laughs> I probably shouldn't call them out, but um, I'm just like, <laughs> hey, <laughs> you guys, I can't give you special treatment, you know? Um, yeah. But I don't think it's a problem for me personally, but other people it may be, and I think that's okay. Know your lane, I would say, and drive that car well. Oh. <laughs> yeah, being able to distance yourself from not get entangled in what they're saying or doing is is key to being professional and and doing a good job as a journalist. You know, and um, kudos to you because you know you've been in as we're seeing in 2020 in a lot of situations that you probably that obviously you would not be in unless you were there covering it. You know, uh, before yeah. we go to the next image, I do want to say what I really do like about this image. One of the things I like about it is that it's shot at a slow shutter speed. And I don't know if that was intentional or not. I know I've done it on accident where I've pulled it up and it was like 30th of a second. Um, <laughs> that's it, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but it works, you know, it's really nice. Um, I just like the, the, the blurriness, the motion and the flag and the, and the guy's arm. And it just has a different feel to it um, than you yeah. know, everything else is so, so crisp and sharp, you know, like, like sports action. Um, yeah. Well, there's so much, there's so much going on. And, and if you think about like this, uh, this fraction of time as opposed to like a you know 10 second clip of this moment mm -hmm. this this is why photography is so compelling and powerful and beautiful is because you don't know before and you don't know after but there's a storytelling moment here and it's it just captivates you you know and you there's just so much energy kinetic energy built up in the photograph um that if you know if it's a video clip then you, you see it all and it plays out. And um, right. I mean, that obviously is very storytelling too, but a still image can hold, can just capture so much energy. This is a great example of it. Yeah, and, and uh, you were talking about Ben Gray. Ben was one of my mentors when I first started um, in, in this uh, world of photojournalism. And he would tell me to try to make images that you can stare at for a while, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of things are happening in, in, yeah. in that this image definitely um, um, does that. You just kind of want to look at it and, and look at all the different details, all the different scenes going on in, in one scene. So yeah, uh, really, really nice job. Um, I'm going to move on to this really, really nice portrait. Um, yes. Yeah, tell us about this one. So this is Wanda Cooper Jones. This is the mother of Ahmaud Arbery. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to make this portrait because Maya Prebu, a reporter at the AJC, did a story about the crime hate relief law. It was um, sh being shopped around the legislative session 
um, during 2020. Um, she had, I mean, this was after the trial and I had photographed her then, but I don't think she had remembered me. And so I was kind of, I had like 10 minutes. I was at a park. I didn't have 10 minutes. Let's say I had 30. Um, but I got there really early. <laughs> I, was, I didn't know what the park looked like. And so I'm trying to find these areas in this park. And this is in Augusta. Um, and so I, um, try to find an area. She comes, we have a conversation. I didn't like the area that I was in. So I'm moving around, you know, and I think this may have been maybe the second place we took images and I had a, um, strobe, a, um, speed light on a soft box kind of behind me. It was probably a horrible time to take pictures. Let's say it was like one or two, you know, that high like <laughs> that um, high sun. But I was able to kind of get her in the shade and get this image of her. Um, she decided to bring that, um, I think that uh, the funeral program with Ahmaud Arbery's uh, picture on it. And uh, we kind of just had a conversation. Like I said, I talked to her a lot about what she had just been doing. She had just come back from Louisville with some of the mothers that were up there. So, you know, before I was talking, before I took the photos, we kind of just had a conversation. And um, I think I was just able to get her comfortable because, um, you know, we were just, like I said, sometimes that connection of just being the same color as someone can kind of make people more comfortable with you being around. And that's not, I mean, that's just the way life is. Um, but this was shot, I believe, with a 50 millimeter I don't use that often in my toolkit because I'm always like eh, eh, trying to get different um <laughs> angles of things but I was happy when I shoot portraits I'm happy to use that uh that nifty 50 because I'm able to really slow down and try to get slow down it. yeah yeah so this was it's, really great and go ahead I was just going to say uh compliment you it's just a beautiful photograph I mean it, and it's so um coming from the the photograph before it mm -hmm. just a complete opposite but at the same time just holds like the same amount of energy. Like the, the there's so much emotion mm -hmm. um, in this in this picture, and that's why I love portraitures because you know you're telling a story with someone's you know their face and their eyes, and her expression is just like what if I look at her eyes too long, I just start to cry. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. it's so uh, piercing. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a moving picture I just it's well done yeah for sure it's it's really really and this is a that's a hard situation what do you say to someone like her you know what do you like it's not a normal situation where you walk in you shoot the shit and you're you know like whatever like yeah. awesome weather like what do you say to her yeah. you know yeah I mean we talked about why we were meeting in Augusta and about how she had family there you know and then she was considering moving I you know I try not to talk about the elephant in the room and we, we will discuss it but I yeah. you know um try to just make her comfortable and I feel also she had been so used to being in the spotlight because mm -hmm. I think she had just did the New York Times had an opinion video that she like talked over about hate crimes laws and mm -hmm. we talked about that also um but yeah I think just talking about things that aren't like how are you you know I like your shirt you know we, we <laughs> talked about if she had other kids you know and like places she was moving to just humanizing the situation oh and also she was a photographer too so oh, we talked wow. about oh wow well she's trying cool. to be she's uh you know trying to do that that's so. amazing yeah. yeah and so many times in situations like this I've learned that people sometimes uh want to talk about anything else but right you know this story yeah. that they've yeah. been living or nightmare in this case, uh, right. ever since it happened. So talking about her shirt or the weather might actually be something refreshing. Mm -hmm. you know? um, yeah. All right, and I think this next picture, yeah, it's, it's the same same story yeah. you're working on. So this was when I was in Brunswick covering that trial outside. It was raining earlier in the day, but after the rain had stopped and I think they had decided that they weren't gonna get bombed or there was gonna be a trial. I honestly don't remember what the end was. Um, they did a march around like the Brunswick area and then they came back and this little kid started dancing. You know how people dance in a circle. So everyone was hyping him up. That's his mom on the left being like, you better. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and so it was just a really good moment. And it was the longest day because I think the trial, I think started at eight or something and that day didn't end. So I would say maybe seven, or, you know, at night. Mm -hmm. So, but it was good to be able to capture that joy that that was, mm -hmm. you know, we're moving forward. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you um, you covered you covered a lot a lot of this uh, whole story, didn't you? I mean, you spent days and or I don't I'm assuming I know that I saw a lot of your work from down there. 
I was just there for the weekend. Honestly, I hadn't gone back uh, after oh, that. Wow. But there was other photographers, Yosef Shen, who was also my coworker. Mm-hmm. I love him. He went down there a little earlier um, to get, you know, the neighborhood. You know, a lot of people were trying to get the neighborhood and the vigil and stuff like that. It's really great to work on at a newspaper with staffers because you all are able to kind of divvy out parts of different stories if you all can't work on them at the same, you know, work on a whole story by yourself, which we really can't do that often here because we're so short staffed. But there are yeah. ways around it. But yeah, so that was a team effort. And I yeah. think our stuff turned out really well. Yeah, that's great. I mean, just like when you were at the the uh, burning police car, I mean, anytime you can team up and, and get a different angle and work things together. I mean, it's it's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this image here, I believe this is in Atlanta, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, tell us about, about this one. So this is outside of a church where the funeral for Sequoia Turner was happening or had just ended. And Sequoia Turner was an eight-year-old girl who was shot while riding in the car with her mother and her, another relative, I want to say her dad, I'm not, entirely sure though while she was going to a convenience store to get something to drink um and this convenience store was just across the street from where Rashad Brooks was shot by police um and so once that happened I remember I went to the vigil um and I was able to see her mom who was very young or at least at least looked very young she um has three kids in total including Sequoia um but just to see that I was like okay I want to try to tell the story deeply Right. And so I tried to reach out to their lawyer because there's a photographer I worked with, Eve Jason. I can't say his last name, Wham Gams. I'm so sorry, Jason. Um, he is a <laughs> photojournalist at the um, Chicago Tribune. And he did this beautiful uh, story where he followed, um, he got to photograph the funeral home getting the body prepared of this little boy that was shot and killed it's a beautiful story it was shot in black and white um mm. and so I reached out to the family you know I was trying to get permission to be able to do that um they essentially said no but my you know persistence paid off because they allowed me to be pulled to photograph the funeral with the intention of not showing the young girl's casket um so I was in there like I said I'm a crier I was crying the entire time like taking pictures wiping tears from my face you know because it's so hard to see children you know this is my classmate I am here to honor the death of a classmate who died for no reason you know and so they're still trying to figure out who killed Sequoia they're still trying to figure out you know is APD a reason this happened because they weren't in the area to survey the area they kind of had left it desolate Mm -hmm. um So this was after the funeral service had happened. I had walked outside and I saw everyone getting prepared, you know, to, as the body was coming out, they were had their wreath, their, you know, um, flowers, their teddy bears. And I um, saw this young girl just kind of looking off in the distance. And I really wanted to capture that youthfulness of like, you know, I'm here to say farewell to my classmate, but also I'm dressed in my Sunday best, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just, it was, like I said, I cried the whole time. Um, and But I was thankful that the lawyer and the family gave me that opportunity yeah. because that picture of the mother and her kids at the altar ended up running um, in the New York Times uh, in the paper. So it was like more people were able to know about Sequoia and try to understand what, she was just going to a convenience store they always went to to go get drinks. Like they were just down the street from their family um, kind of party they were having and she just lost her life. And as a lot of people may know, there's been so many deaths in Atlanta during 2020 that are that you know shooting deaths and all these things happening. So it's like this, it's just interesting. And I yeah, and that persistence in the being a photojournalist and like letting people know your intentions, right? Like that's always right. key. Um, letting letting them know or you know hoping to gain their trust that you're not just somebody out to make a um, you know a sensational photograph, right? Uh, that you that yeah. you really want to help tell their story. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it takes several conversations and, you know, that persistence to, to show them, Hey, look, I'm, I'm, I think the story is important and, and we should, we should tell this story. Um, and speaking of, of crying, I know that um, this next, these next couple of pictures from, uh, you know, from John Lewis, um, his funeral and procession, I know that that was a, had to be a very emotional time for you in covering these. Yes. So I, that image of Ahmaud Arbery's mother, I told you I was in Augusta. I got the, I got the word that I was going to Troy, Alabama while I was in Augusta. So I had to drive from Augusta 
to my house to Troy to start, you know, um, photographing the procession of John Lewis kind of being laid to rest. So um, this was the second day. This is when his body was in Selma. And so there were a lot of, I think all, there were four, three, there were three photographers there and two video folks from our paper. And a lot of like USA Today sent down a photographer from the Tennessee and there was a photographer from an Alabama paper because USA Today kind of sends photographers now like they're like a wire service, which is pretty cool. Um, and so I see this guy getting out the car with these flowers and I'm like, okay, I gotta get this image. So I run to the end of the bridge and I ask him, I said, what are the flowers for? You know, and he told me they're supposed to represent the blood that was shed on the bridge. And so mm -hmm. they have these wet rose petals that they're throwing on the ground. And I got, like I said before, I like to talk to myself. I got super geek because I saw the layering happening and that, and I was like, ah! And so <laughs> I <laughs> took this image. I'm so <laughs> happy to get the layering. I, I love layering. So this for me, I really love this image. I love how he's just like the wind is kind of blowing, you know, the flowers around. And this guy, the way that the funeral home that did this service was so, you know, tight and professional it was just really good to you know see him do that but yeah it's yeah that layering just, um, go ahead Ray. The, sorry there's a question in the chat Alyssa did you oh. uh from someone asking have you uh had you ever met John Lewis before before this I mean before so, like obviously I don't I have never I never shook his hand and told him who I was I had been around him I've realized that I don't do that much. Like I've just been around so many people, but I don't introduce myself. You're so the fly I, on the wall, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but yeah. it could be helpful. Um, so I, <laughs> I never actually said hello, but I had photographed him earlier. They had an exhibit at the um, airport that opened mm -hmm. up about him and he was there. Right. And so I made some images of him, um, but I had, I have never said hi. So that was on me. My best friend like met him one day and was like, y'all are so lucky to have him. He's a treasure. And, and you were one of only a couple uh, photographers, too, I right? The only one oh. allowed to shoot pool in the funeral service. Oh, so okay, the, okay. Uh, okay. All right, the, wow, wow. The was, entire world was like, <laughs> <laughs> No pressure, was right? A, no big deal. Was, yeah, was that a lot of pressure? Oh, How did boy. you work under that? So <laughs> I, I, um, so, so I learned that they, we were gonna get the access. And I was like, I should ask. And I had talked to Bryn Anderson, who's an AP photographer here. We actually went to the same college and I was like, Bryn, I think I should ask, but I'm nervous. She said, just ask. So I asked my editor and they were like, yeah, you can do it. And so I was geeked about that, but I didn't realize how much it would take. So after John Lewis's body flew back from Washington DC to Atlanta, I covered it getting off the plane. I covered the processional from Dobbins Air Force to the Capitol. We had a photographer inside the rotunda, but I was able to move around outside of the Capitol while every, all the photographers were kind of out in this one section. Um, I covered it leaving the rotunda the next day and I covered the funeral service and I even covered the burial. So mm -hmm. the funeral service, I was the only person inside and it was hectic. Um, at first I was like, these pictures are very boring. I was beating myself up because it was like just people kind of sitting, you know, there was the president um, Bush was there, uh, Clinton was there, um, all these people were there, but I didn't feel like anything was really moving or happening, believe it or not, and I don't know how they'll feel about this, but we had not really used the ability, you know, that Canon allows you to take images and then send them to your editor's computer. Um, tra file transfer to FTP. So we had not used that the entire time I was there. And then they were like, and I had used it before and I know how to use it, but they were like, okay, we're gonna use it this time. I was like, oh, we're now using it? Well, that's great. It is because we, <laughs> we needed to use it. But, and yeah. so I was happy because I knew how to use it, you know, and I was kind of teaching my, the person that was catching Bob, my, he's now my assignment editor. I was, he was like, can you send voice notes? I said, yes, I will be talking to the photos. And so he, he would just hear me, he would hear me whispering. I'd be like, that's Nancy Pelosi. You know, <laughs> not that he didn't know, but I mean, the pressure was there, but I, I know how to perform. I think that's just me I've years of just, you know, going through things. But I, 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 I took this image with a two to 400. I was literally laying on the ground with the camera like this. I was super low <laughs> um, trying to get Obama. And then he just kind of struck a few poses. So I was able to get it. Um, but I was going through pictures, just moving. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And Bob was like, slow down. I was like, there's a lot going on, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get these things out. It was a great experience. Like I'm, I'm, I'm very overjoyed and humbled that I was able to do it 
um, and just be in that room. I mean, a lot of people, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Obama was there the whole time, but he didn't come out until it was time for him to speak because he didn't want to be a distraction. So he was like in the back. And at first, all the presidents were kind of on, if you're standing on the stage, the left side. And they had told us like, you cannot walk over here. And they had also told us you may not be able to walk while President Obama speaks. Um, so at first I was like not moving. And then I was like, mm, let me try this. So I just started, you know, casually walking everywhere <laughs> to, the point, <laughs> to the point everybody was like, oh, you're fine. Like Secret Service like, do you need to get by here? I said, oh, yes, I do. Thank you. So, <laughs> um, and so that was fun, you know, just kind of, and people are, essentially when you're a small woman and you have a big camera and people are like, oh, she knows what she's doing. I mean, so that also yeah. helps. Um, but it was an experience. Like even going to the, burial ground I was the only person actually able to be in the burial area there was a lot of people shooting wow. from the fence yeah. and so it was just it was an opera I mean I mean I shot the Super Bowl but this was to me didn't compare so yeah. this yeah. was awesome yeah no no one looking like you know what you're doing is uh is, is, is key to so many things in life and especially photojournalism yes uh, you're exactly right We've got a few more images. Uh, I know we're yeah. a little bit over time here, but I, I don't think it's a problem. I don't think anybody's going anywhere. But we're going from this image to uh, to this one here. And uh, what the <laughs> hell? <is going> on? <laughs> <laughs> so I love this photo too. So I was traveling in the motorcade, which hence this is in probably North Druid <laughs> Hills area. And I just so happened to be shooting out the window. I also didn't know. That's why there's like a smudge in the middle. There's a uh -huh. smudge on the window. But I mean, I can only assume this lady in the red is a Republican and this man in the blue is a Democrat. Uh, <laughs> okay. They were just left get, and right too. Oh. <laughs> they were just giving their feelings. And so I just happened to make this image. This is also one I didn't see till I went to go back in my take, but uh -huh. yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's so great. Wow, wow, that's incredible. Um, before we go to the next one, uh, Jason asked, Jason McDonald said, mm -hmm. Were you dreading talking too loudly, you know, in your to your captions mm -hmm. that president that you were afraid uh, President Obama would look at you like would stop and look at you? So definitely not. Like I said, he came in when it was time to speak and then he left. So I yeah. was whis I was whispering at my camera. I wasn't that close. I was shooting with yeah. a two to four. So it may look like I was close, but I was very, very far away. Yeah. Um, and fun fact, I, uh, so I have seen Obama a lot. Another person I have not introduced myself to, but I probably wouldn't be able to, but I photographed Obama when he went to jury duty in Chicago that one year when he's walking out of his house with a cup. And I didn't know I was going to be able to be that close. I was literally standing on a jungle gym and the people after a while were like, listen, the kids have to play. I said, just give me 10 more minutes <laughs> so that I can make this image and go. But um, yeah, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't that close. And when you have a camera to your face, it's like you're not there. You're not scared. Like it's like a different. Camera, <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> Can't see me. <laughs> uh, oh wow, this is uh, this is incredible. This is one of those moments you're like, hey guys, there's a pandemic, right? <laughs> yes. So this is State Rep. Vernon Jones, who once was a Democrat, now turned Republican, who is also now running for governor against Brian running Kemp. For governor, yeah. Oh wow, yes. I didn't know that. Okay. Yes. So this was when. Trump came to Macon in 2020, I think that may have been his maybe second or third time coming, but this was during the election season and Vernon Jones had gotten on stage and he had come back down. Um, and I was standing on the rafters with AP photographer Bazemore, John Bazemore, and we're just standing there talking and chatting. And then John goes, he's surfing. And <laughs> I, you know, I picked my camera up. And so I just see Vernon Jones reluctantly being up. lifted um, up. You know, he looked happy, but and there were some points where he was like, put me down. Like, you could literally see him say, please put me down. But I was <laughs> ready to go in that moment. I had a two to four on. And, you know, that's why you kind of see this railing in the front. But I just, it was quick. Um, and so me and John, I believe, got that image. Um, his ended up going on the Saturday Night Live. There was like a, um, you know, at the end where they do the news thing, where they talk the about show. the news. Yeah. Oh, the daily um, update? Yeah. The Weekend update. update. Weekend yeah. update. That's it, yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, that that happened, and he had no mask on. But hey, that's uh, 2020 in a nutshell. And and speaking of of 2020, this is right. uh, this is this is an incredible image because you were there when they the electors signed um, the electoral votes for um, Biden, right? At, yes. At the legislature. 
Yes. Wow. They allowed a few people in the back. If you've ever been in the Senate chambers, there's like this wall where people, media usually sits. They allowed three people back there and then everybody else was up in the gallery. Um, I decided to stay on the floor. I think there probably would have been better image in the gallery. But um, this is a picture <laughs> of all of the signatures of the, I think there was, I don't remember how many people, I think maybe 16, um, that signed for the Electoral College. And the man actually holding the paper has signed for Jimmy Carter, Obama, I want to say Clinton. Like he has been there. Oh, every the Democratic time. president. Yes, every it, Democratic yeah. president. Yeah, he's yeah. been in the session wow. for so long. But it was just so great to be in that room. I mean, it was pretty, I don't want to say boring because it was a historical thing, but it was just, a, you know, pomp and circumstance. But I was happy to be there to um, get this moment of, you know, these people rejoicing for who they thought was the better candidate, so... Yeah, you know, because the Republicans decided to have their own sign. That's right, you were there. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't get in the room. Here's here's an example, kids, of like just going in and doing it. Because I was there. Ben was there before me, and um, you know, Ben has been at the legislature so long. I mean, he. I mean, I wasn't there to get it. Like, I wasn't there in time to get this that, right. that actual happening. But Ben just like walks into rooms. You know what I mean? Like, he just went in there and got it. And uh, yeah, that was incredible. Uh, that that the whole day was was wild, but um, but anyway, moving right along, this is uh, the last image of your presentation. Um, thank you so very much for um, for sharing this with us. If you guys have any questions, throw them up here on the chat. We'll we'll get them in. Uh, you know, or uh, I guess you can unmute or yeah, we could. Uh, isn't there like a raise hand function? Either yeah, way, I'll stop the screen share. For a second here and see. Oh, there we go. Yeah. See everybody. Yeah, there we go. There we go. If you guys have have any questions for Alyssa, throw them at us. Um, and you know, I'm sure she's got a few minutes to uh, <laughs> to uh, talk to you guys. Um, but you had quite an eventful 2020, Alyssa. That um, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. That was that was an incredible slideshow. Thank you for sharing that with us. How long did you have to go through like 20, 20 images to, to select those? Because you had a lot more. What do you really want to know? I had <laughs> like 40 photos and then I was like, okay, I got to cut this down. I ended up trying to that's put like four on a page. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. You, did, you did really, really good. Yeah. Because we always tell people, say we, we started like, if you can come up with 10 to 15 photos and I think you had like 22 uh, or 20, uh, 19, something like that. Um, Anyway, tell tell our speakers if they come up with like ten to fifteen photos, it would be perfect. Yeah, and then yeah. they're like, "Here, here's sixty. Here's sixty. I can't, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't stop." So, uh, you know what it's like editing your own work, right? Yeah, oh, it's terrible. Yeah. Hard. It's hard. Nathan, do you have a, a question? Yeah, uh, that's kind of, um, I think a lot of us have seen the photo you took of Parker Short being arrested, Representative Parker, uh, re not Park Park Cannon. Park I'm sorry, Cannon. Parker, Short, yeah. Someone completely different um <laughs> representative cannon getting arrested i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you made that photo but also covering those situations which are obviously insanely intense that you have to make sure while you're also you're getting these photos that you're also not getting arrested yourself which obviously gsp i guess has kind of learned their lesson but <laughs> yeah so i don't want to say i took that photo well let's just say how that day happened so real quick you know they passed the bill in the legislative session, they passed it in the Senate, automatically went down to the governor. I was told when I went back to my chambers that he was gonna sign it the day after. So I'm texting my editor, I'm like, just so you know, he's gonna sign the bill tomorrow. And then I hear from GPB that he's gonna sign it tonight. He's only allowing GPB in the room. And I said, that's not fair. So I, so I texted his comms person. I said, hey, let me get in the room. You know, it'll be quick. I'm not gonna be in the way. And he said, no, we'll hand out a picture and I wasn't taking it. So I went downstairs and I said, hey, I talked to two people in that room that had no idea. I mean, they were his staff, but they didn't know. And I was just like, listen, it doesn't make sense. You need a stills person in there. If you're gonna have GPB in there, it doesn't make sense not to have a stills agency. We can get the photos out quick. I don't know how long it's gonna take you to get the picture. I don't know if you're gonna Photoshop the picture. I'm just jabbing. And they're like, okay. And then they never get back to me. So I'm standing outside the door, pissed because it doesn't make sense as to why you won't let me in. And then I decided in that moment, I wasn't leaving until I got a picture of Cam. That's why I was still there when yeah. Park Cannon came downstairs and Erica Thomas came downstairs. There was also maybe seven women protesters there not being physical at all, they just had signs. Um, and that's when 
you know, the, the whole debacle happened and I was ready to go. You know, I, um, they started arresting her. I started taking images. I saw they were dragging her to the elevator. I decided I was going to run down the stairs wait for them to get out the elevator. I'm the type of photojournalist that anticipates what's going to happen. I don't, I wouldn't stand there and follow her at the elevator. I was like, they're going to get out. That's why when you see her down there being dragged, a few of those other images that I was the only person there. Cause I was like, I know they're going downstairs one. I also knew there was only one entrance and exit to the building. Um, so I take those pictures. I take that photo of her getting, you know, put in the car. I'll be honest with you, the point where they were shoving her in the car, I did literally stop taking pictures and walk away because I had a trigger of being detained during the summer. And I almost did cry, but I pulled it back together, turned back around. I kept taking photos. Um, she left. And then again, what did I tell you? I wasn't leaving till he left. So I went back in that building um, and I stood down there happened to be Georgia State troopers that were pretty much all over the hallways because now they were anticipating violence. So they were going to walk him out. So I stood there um, and I had a, actually had a law enforcement officer talk to me. You know how I was telling y'all earlier, some people just talk to me and say things they shouldn't. And I'm just like, hmm. He said some things he shouldn't. And I was just like, hmm. Um, and so I stood there and we, talk, we spoke for an hour. And then the governor ended up leaving and he was surrounded by his you know, security. He was, so Georgia State Troopers walked him out. There were like five of them behind him. And I took that image. And then as I sit down to send the photo, they said, ma'am, you gotta leave. Cause it had been too long. It was like eight o'clock at night and he had already closed the building. Your question was, do am I afraid that I'm gonna be um, detained during that situation? I was not. I was not because I knew what I was supposed to be doing. I knew I, was, I had the right to be there. I've become one of those people that I know my rights, know your rights, you know, <laughs> like, I had a right to be in that building. I had a right to photograph. As long as you are not obstructing anything, they really, they can, they can obstruct you, but they have no reason to put their hands on you. And I know that if they did, I would know what to say. At the same time, I've covered the legislative session three years now, not fully. Um, and most of the state troopers know me. They may not know my name, but they know that girl's running around with the camera. Um, and so they know what I'm doing and who I work for. So that helps. Um, but I'm, I'm not, um, I, I don't want to say I took that photo out of spite, but it, he should have let me in the room um, <laughs> to take that picture, I think. Um, and so that's why I took the picture of him walking out the door. But it doesn't make sense to, like, why are you not, why are you obstructing me? I, I would like a reason. I know he doesn't have to give me one. He essentially is the president of the state in a sense. So it's like, I don't have to tell you anything, but yeah. I, I, I'm doing my job and my job is to document what's going on. So I'm going to do that. And if you're going to walk out flagged, I mean, flanked by security, I'm going to make that image because that's what happened. And that was the same hallway Park Cannon had been dragged down. So it was very, to me, symbolic that he was being marched down and she was being dragged out the building. Yeah. Yeah, I can image. tell you're pa I can tell you're passionate about everything. What is your T-shirt passionate about? <laughs> oh, it's passionate about compassion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a um, Andre 2000 shirt. Um, but yeah, are those your mentors over your shoulder? Um, you could uh, you could say there's a Vivian Meyer book over there. I really like street photography. I like to be the fly on the wall that just like waits for scenes to happen and then you take an image. That's my main love, but that doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> so um, yeah, you could Vivian Meyer. I've got some um, songs with my people, which is a photo book about black photographers. Um, yeah. So lots of great stuff up there. Very nice, very nice. Uh, I, I know I speak for all of us when I say that um, it was it was an incredible journey uh, to see your of twenty twenty through your eyes tonight. That was that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thank you. And uh, Ray, you got any closing thoughts for uh, for us? Photo night thoughts. I mean, I'd like to say thanks to Alyssa as well uh, for sharing, for being an open book and telling your your story and your insights. And um, I don't think it's. I mean, it's just so incredibly powerful for young photographers to hear from someone like you, um, just to tell their story in a, just an honest way. Um, you know, it's really, really, it's, it's really meaningful. I, I've, you know, we've all been there in that position as a young photographer. So, um, this one, I give you, you know, credit, extra credit for that as well as your amazing work. And, uh, I look forward to seeing a street photography book of Atlanta. 
um, hey, you know, so, in the next next couple <laughs> of years. So um, otherwise, yeah, uh, we're going to be following Alyssa's work throughout the year. Again, we'll have her on next year to talk about 2021. <laughs> hey. um, but otherwise, yeah, everyone, thank you for, for coming again on this uh, beautiful spring evening. Uh, we have our next event, May 27th, with Stephanie Ely. Um, look her up. She's incredible. Um, and, and then a big, big, big event planning, being planned for June, which is uh, ATL Photo Night's five-year anniversary. So uh, get ready. Okay. Prepare <laughs> yourselves. Um, but tonight's about Alyssa. Alyssa, thank you so, so much. Um, and uh, we'll see everyone um, in about four weeks, I guess, right? Follow us yeah. on social media. Follow us on wherever, send us a message anytime. Um, if you have a question, uh, follow Alyssa. Uh, she's posting amazing work every day. Um, and subscribe to the AJC if you live in Atlanta. It's hey, the there you go. Uh, Buy a yeah, newspaper. Yeah. Buy, Buy a newspaper. A newspaper. Get you a go. subscription. Yes, yes, That's yes. right. That's right. Support, Support Alyssa's work. Local work. journalism. In local journalism and all visual journalists. My folks that I work with are great. I'm going to stand on my soapbox real quick and say that they've been at the paper for 20 something years. And if no one truly appreciates them, I do because they've given me such great insight. If you see one of these old men walking around <laughs> Atlanta taking photos of the state, just say hi. They're awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> they appreciate you. Yeah, uh, hopefully. Well, good night, everyone. Thanks again for another successful ATL photo. All night. right. See you guys here in uh, four weeks. Good night, everybody. See you, everybody. Bye. Good night.